Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Danny Fallon. I am the director of the Wendy Clegg Center for Autism and Developmental Disabilities here at the Bloomberg School. Uh, I'm also the chair of the Department of Mental Health here at the school. And so it's my pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this afternoon's symposia. Um, we at the Wendy Clegg Center work to understand the causes, consequences, co-occurring issues in autism and developmental disabilities, really through the lens of what the power of public health can bring to the challenges faced by individuals, their families, and entire societies um, due to autism spectrum disorder, and to think about ways that we can sort of maximize the potential of individuals with autism, as well as to prevent associated disabilities. Uh, we're here today talking about the CDC numbers. Uh, the CDC for the last 15 years has funded national surveillance, uh, estimating the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder in the United States. Our uh, center, and specifically Lee Ching Lee, who will be our first speaker, has been the PI of the Maryland site that contributes to those national numbers. And when that was first reported in 2007, the national estimates were one in 150 eight-year-olds with autism spectrum disorder. Today, the recent numbers that came out are one in 59. So that's a dramatic increase in a relatively short amount of time. And we can spend some time thinking about the reasons for that, and certainly in our first talk, you will hear some of those reasons when we dig deeper into these numbers. Uh, but regardless of the reason, it does mean there are increasing numbers of individuals receiving these diagnoses, and rightly so, expecting services and solutions uh, for themselves and their families. So today, we hope to take a deeper look at those numbers. And then to think about what it means in terms of needed services and societal um, perspectives on autism spectrum disorder, not only for children, but also for adults. So we'll look at those numbers, then we'll hear from someone who runs a nonprofit that focuses on these kinds of services and opportunities for children and adults. And then we'll take those numbers and project them into the future to see what children with autism become in terms of adults with autism demographically uh, in the United States. And that will give you a sort of landscape of where we're all heading as a, as a community and a society when it comes to autism. So then after that, we'll take a break. And then we will have a guest panel of folks who work in this field to answer our questions and some questions by um, uh, me as the moderator about what you've heard today and sort of what's going on and what the challenges are moving forward. And I've been asked to give you a little bit of administrative information. Um, the first is not administrative, but rather the deepest heartfelt thank you for our center administrator, Michelle Landrum, who it probably is, where are you, Michelle? Yeah, right there, who really has masterminded um, putting this together. She's the one who said, you know, these new CDC numbers are going to come out. And um, you know, we're always struggling with what that means and where we should go with this. And, and she also feels passionate about what we do in thinking about as a society, how we move from childhood to adulthood, um, generally, but certainly uh, amongst those um, autistic individuals and the needs that they're facing. And so we put this all together, and then the numbers didn't come out when we thought. And so, um, so then she had to then very creatively rethink when we could make this still happen. So thank you all for being here, even though the, the term is already over, and we're moving into summer, and it's the first finally sunny day here in Baltimore. Um, and all of you are still showing your dedication to be here in this windowless room. So thank you very much for that. Um, the thing I will say in regard to that is there are many uh, of uh, the audience who actually haven't chosen to be in this room and who are watching this via webcast. So welcome to all of you who are viewing this via webcast. We're glad that you could also be a part of this. And all of this is being recorded and will be available on our website after it's had a little bit of post-processing. So um, if you feel like you have to miss some pieces, hopefully you can catch back up. Uh, we're, you're welcome to um, raise awareness, talk about things you've heard here via Twitter. Um, the handles that uh, we would recommend are the at Johns Hopkins SPH, which is the school's handle, and the at Hopkins underscore WKC, which is the Wendy Clegg Center handle. Uh, please silence any phones if you have them not on um, vibrator silence now. And then the last thing that I wanted to say administratively is the way we're going to handle questions, we will invite questions after each of the three um, um, formal talks. 
And then we'll also invite questions during the panel. But the way we'll do that is there are index cards in your program, as well as additional index cards from our assistants in the back of the room. So if you have a question, you can write at the time that you're thinking of the question, go ahead and write it down, um, or at the end, write it down. And then just raise your hand, and one of our uh, assistants will come by and pick it up and then bring it up here so that we can then ask them verbally uh, through the microphone. And that's because we're webcasting, it makes it easier to, to process. If you have any questions about that during the time, just you know, raise your hand and an assistant will come and explain to you if you don't have a card in front of you or something like that. Uh, and then um, I think that's the last administrative thing I was told to make sure God said. So I want to end by saying a little bit about the Wendy Clegg Center for Autism and Developmental Disabilities. The center and its public health focus was started and inspired by a very special person named Wendy Clegg, who is the late wife of our Dean Emeritus, Dr. Michael Clegg. Uh, and she was dedicated, and you'll hear more in just a second, to promoting um, better lives for children with disabilities. And, uh, and all the things that we do in her name are in the service of that memory and in really making the public health footprint and what we can do from our perspective come alive. And so I would like to welcome and invite Dr. Clegg up here um, to give a couple more introductory comments before we start with our speakers today. So, Dina Maris Clegg, welcome. Thanks, Dana. <laughs> Thanks. That's, thank you. So it's great to be here, and uh, I'm so excited uh, because the numbers have been so long in coming out. I'd like to hear maybe at the panel discussion why the numbers have taken so long to come out, but uh, what the story is there. But, but uh, I just wanted to come and welcome you. Uh, I'm very proud of the center, Danny's leadership, and uh, Michelle's incredible support of, of everybody at the center, Lee Ching, and uh, everybody who's talking today. And I think, you know, uh, many of you know that our daughter was diagnosed at age five in 1995 with autism and now is 27. And um, when I looked at the literature back in 1995 about autism, it wasn't, it wasn't a very rich literature. It was thought to be totally a genetic disease, incurable. And, um, and so for many years, because of that, there was not the emphasis that there should have been on gene environment interactions, which we know are important for almost every chronic disease. The other thing that, that uh, has bothered me from the first time I opened a textbook before, when I was in medical school, long before Sarah was born, was that the word that always modified uh, uh, autism was incurable. And that sends the message then that there's nothing you can do, right? It's incurable. Uh, and, and I think for many years, that was the, that, that, that viewpoint uh, was the reason that children with autism were shunted aside. And, and uh, luckily now we know the power of early intervention. We have much more to learn. Uh, we know that, um, that autism is a complex uh, phenotype. It's a, it's a syndrome that, and for those of you who have worked with children with autism, you know there's a whole range of, of disabilities and, and things that are affected by autism and no two kids are seemingly alike. So, so it presents challenges in studying it, but as Danny said, the the increase in prevalence of autism in, in the U.S., the reasons not yet clear for the rapid increase, but it is, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a public health problem. And so I care about autism initially because my daughter has it, but then when you look at the public health impact and the economic impact, there's a reason that there are reasons everybody should care about autism. Uh, for the issues that we have in this country, they're profound in terms of uh, treatment and detection awareness. But outside the U.S., um, the situation is dire. Uh, there are children who will never get services uh, in, in many low- and middle-income countries. So, so as a school, we lead in, in public health. But this center, one of the things I'm very proud about under Danny's leadership, that it has involved not just the School of Public Health, but our colleagues at Kennedy Krieger School of Medicine and across the university. So to look at not only etiology, epidemiology, but also issues related to policy, uh, entitlement programs. And, and I'm excited to hear today about the demographic projections because it's clear to me, it's, having uh, been in this uh, journey now for some years with Sarah, that we're riding a tidal wave of children who are becoming adults with autism. So I want to thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it and uh, keep up the great work. So. Now, 
This has always been the awkward, there we go. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce our first, and turns out also our third speaker. Uh, Dr. Lee Ching Lee is an associate scientist in the Department of Epidemiology and also in the Department of Mental Health here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, as I mentioned before, she is also the PI of the Autism and Developmental Disabilities Monitoring Network, or what we call the ADAM Network, which is the CDC for surveillance program that uh, produces these numbers. Uh, Li Ching is not only a current faculty, but also an alumna and graduate of our programs. She got her master's degree here before going to UNC for her doctoral work and then came back as faculty in 2004 and has been part of the school ever since and has been part of the Wendy Clegg Center since its founding and serves as an associate director for the Wendy Clegg Center, primarily in global um, work that she does. So the things that, that Mike mentioned in terms of the global footprint of autism are incredibly important. You won't hear about that today, but I encourage you um, beyond the surveillance work that she's doing in the US to check out the work that she's been doing around the world. So welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. So. Without further ado, let's go. Let's start it. I was told that I'm not supposed to move around a lot because I tend to do that. So they say it's a videotaping, so I need to behave myself. <laughs> okay. All right, this is today's online. I will first walk through a little bit briefly about the network, and uh, we will talk about um, prevalence estimate. Now, what we already know, and we will review the trends of these estimates. So, ATEN is an Autism and Developmental Disability Monitoring Network. So currently, the most recent study, I'm going to call SY, stand for Severance Year. Those are uh, 11 funded sites, and we are one of the 11 sites here on the map. This is for the new data that just came out last month, so that's why I used this map um, to, to do the introduction. So Athens go here. Athens is funded by CDC. Probably most of you already know about that. Try to try to determine the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder in the U.S. Not just autism is also other developmental disabilities as well. We, the goal is to provide a comparable and population-based estimate of this prevalence rate. Okay, this other is a record-based surveillance. So we focus on the eight years old children who reside in the catchment area in the different study sites. It's multiple state, as you already seen in the map. It's a populational based. And then the clinician will validate it, which I will go through the approach, what we did. We have a clinical validation on the diagnosis. And after the cases is identified, we link these cases to their birth certificate data. So we will be able to get more information about uh, prenatal or birth outcome information. And then um, apply the standardized methods such as the case definition and case finding approaches. So exactly what is the approach that Adam is using? So it's education records and clinical records. It's, un, it's really impossible, as you can imagine, in the U.S. You go to door to door to knock on every single household to find a year old. That can be impossible. So what Adam did, the approach would be go to um, education records. So we collaborate with the Department of Education to pull out the, the list that who receives services under the special education and then we get the permission to review and abstract their education records. Doing the same, we would do the clinical records where you go to care providers. So in Mar Youth in Maryland, as the example, that would be Kennedy Quaker Institute, they provide, as you already know, that they provide services for family with autism and other developmental disabilities, and then Dr. Linda, who is here today, she is the director of a um, card and, and leading the effort at the Kennedy Quaker Institute. So in Maryland, that would be, we will abstract the record from schools, individual schools. We will review and abstract the records. We will go to Kennedy Quaker Institutes 
<coughs> excuse me, to abstract the medical records. And we will also go to Mount Washington and uh, University of Maryland medical systems. So all these abstracted records, we will put, compile together and review by the trained clinician expert that's trained by Dr. Denta at the Kennedy Quaker Institute. So after the autism diagnosis is determined, uh, that's how we calculate the prevalence. So other sites would use in the similar approach. This is the most recent data that you, you probably already heard of, right? So this is from the community reports, 1.7% or 1 in 59. This is the prevalence estimate. Right now, um, that was reported by other network. So well, I just want to put it there just for, it actually is 16.8, but thousand was slightly, I know it's rounding up, but we round here and there. But when we do the calculation, if I don't say that later on, when you do the calculation, you say, like, no, that's a two people off. What's going on there? So I just want to let you know it's rounding off. It's 1.7% in the Aden communities, so those are part, the 11 sites compiled together. If we look at the prevalence estimate by source, why we want to talk about why this is important. The reason being in thinking about, here we have two types of source. The dark blue is education records in partial surveillance area. And then the, the purple one, the purple one, it's educational records in full surveillance area. So basically, we just want to tell you that when you have a more complete record, when you have more complete coverage in the records and in the, pop, in the, in the potential uh, cases, you are more likely to have a higher prevalence. Thinking about the denominator when we calculate the prevalence, it's the eight years old who reside in that catchment area. So you want to make sure you identify as many kids, who, who, when I say as many, I mean as complete cases as possible. So that's why when you read this prevalence, I want you to, I, we will walk through and you will see the differences later on um, in the prevalence numbers. We also want to look at Maryland, our own state. Our prevalence rate is 2%. There's no rounding, I think it's, it's is over 20 per thousand. So higher than other network that is a combined that we just see. Okay. So right here, why would I want to review this? It's really important that later on, this is new data, again, new data that was just published. I want to show you by the child sex and by the site, we know that as of now, all the literature to us, boys to girls, it's about four to five to one. So boys is about four or five times than girls. So for here, um, we want to see the light color. The, those are, are boys and the bottom one, the bottom one, the, the dark color, that those are, Wait a second, wait a my, uh, I thought I had, okay. So for the light color, those part, I don't know why the bar is not show on the slides. The darkest color, that was meet the criteria for intellectual disabilities. The lighter color part, those are not meeting the criteria for intellectual disability. What does that mean, intellectual disability? In this case, we define it by IQ. So IQ less than 70, that's the dark color at the bottom part of it. Okay, so what do we see here? You see many of them actually do not have intellectual disability. And that percentage is quite different from, you know, when we look at this, in the past, 20 years ago, you probably see when people talk about individuals with autism spectrum disorder, you heard that, oh, they, the, 
they have a lot, the, the percentage with intellectual disability is much higher. So now if we look at this differently, um, we are going to do this by sex and by race and ethnicity. So let's focus, let's look at the white here, right here, the white and Hispan, non-Hispanic. For example, on the top part, that's IQ greater than 85. The middle one, the middle part here, that's uh, IQ between 71 to 85. And these two combine are the one uh, who don't fall under intellectual disability. So you will see this is a female and male. So what do we see here? The percentage, of course, the y-axis is a percentage. So what do we see? Roughly 75% of a female in white non-Hispanic don't have ID, intellectual disability. So roughly about 80% of male white non-Hispanic don't have the intellectual disability. But on the other hand, let's move to the black non-Hispanic. What do we see here? Again, roughly, it's about say um, forty-eight percent do not have an ID. In other words, if you look at it the other way, it would be fifty-two percent with ID in male, and roughly about forty-one percent with the ID in uh, in male, and then the female. Sorry about that. So, what does that tell us? Do you see the racial ethnicity difference here? For black, more identified cases here are with ID. For white, the percentage is lower with ID. So those are something that we want to keep in mind when we review the, the preference. Many of you already heard people say diagnosis criteria change. And now we have a DSM-5 in addition to DSM-4. All the case definitions so far in Athens reported prevalence, it's based on DSM-4, which is the previous diagnosis system that was used starting from 1994 to 2013. Starting from 2013, there are DSM-5 in the community practice. So, so Athens, this is the first time ever, was able to review DS, using the DSM-4 and DSM-5 criteria. So in other words, with the same group of children, some would have a DSM, you know, we, we review them, use, apply the two diagnosis system. But I do have some note for you here. It's DSM-5 is only reported in the 81% of the population that the Adam reported DSM-4, so it's not identical population, but it's 81% of. But 80, in this, in this uh, figures, I want to show you that among those who have been reviewed using DSM-4 and DSM-5 both, 86% met both criteria, which is expected, right, you would think. think. But 19, not, I'm sorry, 9% have only meet DSM-4 only, which is the older version. And 5% have DSM-5 only. So DSM-4 to, then, then, then later on, I want to show you that the prevalence estimate is about uh, 16 per thousand. So roughly, it's about 1.6% if you use DSM-5's criteria. As compared to earlier, we have 1.68% if you use a DSM-4. So it's really, really similar. So you will probably wonder, wow, well, why would I need to know? I don't do diagnosis. Why would I need to care about DSM-4 versus DSM-5? Yes, we do care. We need to care. The diagnosis change would will make the people meet the criteria. As you can see, 5% versus 9%. These 14% of people, some, on, nine only apply to the old criteria. Five only apply to the new criteria. That also involved the implication is about services, whether they will be eligible for services and insurance payout. 
So, and also when we talk about ideology, which we don't, it's not the focus of today's talk, but when we do research, when we talk about ideology, we want to know who are the cases we define. So talking about the diagnosis criteria is very important. So one of the messages from the most recent ad and pregnancy report, I just want to highlight some instead of, oh, you will be able to find the community report or the MNWR report online at the CDC slash artisan. So some of the message I want to share with you from the most recent report is that 85% um, of these children who have been identified with autism, with ASD, 85% of them already have developmental concern by age three. However, only 42% receive a developmental evaluation by age three. Not even half, even though they already have the concern. And we know that although ASD can be diagnosed as early as two years of age, the median age right now was identified was four years and four months. So there's a huge gap, as you can see, right? Two years and two months today for if we can, you know, if we would have diagnosed the kids right to, the early intervention would be able to involve or carry out, which is extremely important for individuals with ASDs. So now we are, let's look at the trend. So what we just review is the current most recent report. Let's look at the trend. So the trend, the surveillance year found to, on the left column here, you can see 2000 to 2014. And then that corresponds to the birth year because all kids will be the eight years old. So it will be 19, birth year 1992 to 2006. These are the participating sites. And the number of kids we identify is more than 5,000 in this case. So here are the prevalence. Starting from 6.7 per thousand in surveillance year 2000, all the way to now 16.8, which is roughly about 1% increase. Well, when I say 1% increase, I mean the prevalence is increased from 6.7 6 per thousand to 16.8. That, that is a huge increase. Try to eat. Uh, answer Mike's question about why it takes so long to come out the data. Even right now, last month, you just report 2014. Because high quality data are worth waiting for. So that's why in other networks work about and beyond try to provide the most high quality data and then to, to provide that accurate. What we do is, so for example, right now we are working on for the, let's use an example, surveillance year 2014. We have to wait until all the elder kids in the, let's say in 2015, all the kids, their records, school records and medical records already get into their file. So we will go there, let's say 2015 to review and abstract these records. And in Maryland, for example, you know, our abstractors have to go to individual each individual schools. I think it's, um, for, it's, there are hundreds and hundreds of schools they need to go to. And that takes time. And then also, you know, oh, and then we, we have to go through that Athens approach, try to make sure the quality are high quality and as accurate as it could be. So here's the prevalence estimate trend by site Then we put together. So roughly, what I've tried to show you in color is from the light color to the dark color to reflect the cohorts or the surveillance year, I should say. So what do you see here? It's quite obvious, right? The overall trend is from, from the earlier to the most recent one. That trend is increasing quite significantly. If we look at New Jersey, what do you see there? It's a 2.9% or 29 per thousand in New Jersey in the most recent report. That's really, really high as compared to other sites. 
In Maryland, we are dry at the 2%, as we earlier just reviewed. So what the trend tell us, yes, we do see it's increasing, there's no doubt. And that increase is not in just in New Jersey, it's actually it's overall across all sites. Okay. Just want to pull out our own state, Maryland, so we can take a bit more uh, closer look. So in Maryland, starting our province, our own states, we starting from 6.3 all the way to now, the most recent one, that was 2%. Here is our autism prevalence rate per, per thousand. So what you can see here, it's increasing, there's no doubt, it's a step by step, right? I also want, it's so important for us to talk about disparity. We already know uh, in the literature, as I earlier say, boys to girls is about roughly four to five, yeah, four to five times. So here I want to show you the figures. So the, the green line in the bottom, that's a female, so it's a girl, on the top it's a male. So we can see that, that ratio, ratio is a prevalence rate ratio, boys to girls is still roughly about four to five. But you can see because the, the prevalence increases over time, the, the ratio is actually still within that range of about four to five. It's a fourth. How about race and ethnicity? So on the top one, that's white. As we earlier reviewed, white, they do have a highest est the prevalence, the estimate of prevalence. This is the most recent data. We can see that throughout the very beginning of the surveillance year, actually, the pattern, the trend seems all similar. The increases over time, increases across all race and ethnicity. It's a, the nines are almost parallel to each other, as you can tell. So that the race, in other words, the, the increased race is similar. But why stay about, I said, the highest prevalence rate? Followed by black, and then the bottom line would be the Hispanic. So the, that actually still tell us about race and, and the, the disparity. But you can argue, well, maybe it's maybe because of many reasons, right? First, we don't know what exactly causes autism, so we cannot attribute this disparity due to the difference or the exposure or the causes of our, you know, due to the real factors. So what are the possible factors? That will probably take a lot of, uh, of if we want to talk about that in the uh, more comprehensive way, it will take hours. But briefly, let's talk about what are the possible reasons contribute to the gap, and also contribute to, please allow me to fill it back to the slides here. Also contribute to these trends. Same, what are the factors? Possibly to relate to the services. We know the preferences tend to be higher in the area or the community that have more services. But the po policy, po there's a partially can be related to the policy. If it, it, the policy say all kids need to screen for autism, more screening are more likely to provide more information and documentation to, to make the diagnosis. And also the, the family resources, right? Resources in the community and the family, socioeconomic status, insurance, insurance as well. Those would all contribute to that. In New Jersey, some people will come at the front. These numbers come up. People will first say, must be the air or the water in New Jersey is a particular toxic. And it's not a joke because that actually was widely discussed in media. People, okay. So remember, we don't know what caused autism. Making an assumption about the air and because it's a poor city. P-O-R-T, I know my pronunciations may not be clear. It's a poor city, so maybe it's um, uh, the pollution. But right now, as of the data that colleagues conduct, 
part, you know, do some uh, sensitivity analysis or do some subgroup analysis to try to find out what are the possible reasons. And we thought that the very possible reason may be because of the services. And remember, the catchment area make a big difference too. What are the catchment area participants in the artisan surveillance sites are likely to be high, have more resources, more services, as compared to those that are not participating in other sites. Okay, so I want to, I want to acknowledge this, the other network. So collaborate with Maryland State Education, Department of Education to get all the information, and our the PI of Dr. Rebecca Lenda, the Kennedy Quaker Institute, really leading the effort for provide the clinic, clinical expertise in determining the case definition, and also our at the network uh, participate inside that contribute all the data, make this possible. And also uh, the, the sources for medical records from the Kennedy Cooker Institute in Washington and the University of Maryland. And we also want to thank Maryland Department of um, and Department of Health, Health Department, help us uh, for all the health birth records. And I cannot thank enough for our Maryland Athens team members. They are here and here. And Rebecca Harrington, she's the co-PI for our school public health team. And Margaret Huston and Penjara is our new member. Margaret is our coordinator. They have been working above and beyond to make the project succeed. And Wendy Craig Center, our colleagues, dear colleagues and staff and, and Michelle have been incredible to help out with all the aspects for the other network, as, as a, particularly for the outreach. And our CDC and CVDDD colleagues, John Bio, who have been um, help us with the data. Thank you, every, and I want to thank all of you for your attention for the presentation. Thanks. And I think that's what uh, exactly why we want to have this symposium and our expert panels here to bring us. So stay tuned for another <laughs> 30 minutes, right? Because we, I think that's what we are going to discuss. I, yeah, you go ahead. Go ahead. I was just say to add to that, um, I, I think we didn't say, but for those of you who don't know, both the, the surveillance projects across the country and a etiology case control study across the country were funded by congressional mandate. And so they, the funding to do these studies to begin with came from federal mandate to do. Um, and there is also an interagency coordinating committee across all federal um, agencies to pay attention to what the federal government is doing in autism based on these numbers and other things. Um, so at least at the federal level, that's sort of answered. I think at the state and local, it really is heterogeneous. Yeah. Oh boy, yeah. Um, the next question is, do higher prevalence areas have more severe case mix? That's a good question. We don't know. We, ha we have not analyzed the data by the, you know, by the, uh, the resources stable cross with the, the severity of it. But that's a really good point. But if you point. think it's attracting people to the services, you might expect a more severe it, it, Exactly. So I think that 
in the literature and also in some of the sensitivity analysis, I think we think that, as you can all imagine, right, higher, the more services definitely attract the more people come to the region. This but whether that's related to the severity, I don't know. Or whether it's a better identification or families' resources. Some, sometimes the family recognize the need. It also can be that. Related to that second point, um, the follow-up question was, has anyone looked at whether there's a different prevalence of children born within versus outside the catchment area? So when they're eight-year-olds in New Jersey, were they born in New Jersey or were they born in another state and moved to New Jersey? Good point. So actually, that was, it's going to be in the next talk there. We were unable to track those people who are in migration versus on migration. <clears throat> in Athens, what we did was we catch that surveillance year, they are resident of catchment area. So they can move in. Um, but you have the birth We do. We do. Absolutely. So when those people who, if they, let's say they move in, they there after birth. We will not be able to attempt their birth data, or vice versa. If they they were born in the catchment area and then they move out, well, move outside the catchment area, we may not be able to capture them. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Our next presenter is Mr. Eric Sozano. Um, who is the executive director of CSAC. Um, he joined CSAC as director of operations in 2017, but has been affiliated and was president of its board prior to that. Um, he owns a historic building, which has held numerous um, nonprofit organizations. And having lived as a family member, and we talked about this at lunchtime, and, and he may share more with you about that during the presentation, uh, Mr. Salzano is dedicated to providing state-of-the-art services to individuals uh, supported through CSAC. And to tell you a little bit about, more about Mr. Salzano, um, he has 37 years of experience in management um, and business. He worked as a general manager and district manager in the grocery food industry um, and has managed workforces of uh, up to 1,200 people and had to um, uh, manage budgets of approximately $180 million. Um, he has expertise in turning around negative performing operations and making them profitable and has applied that same kind of thinking uh, into management of the CSAC nonprofit. Uh, he has mentored young entrepreneurs with new business startup companies, um, and we are lucky to have him in the area. He's a native of Washington, D.C., uh, and attended Montgomery College as well as the University of Maryland, and we look forward to hearing about the Community Services of Autism Adults and Children organization. So welcome. Thank you. Let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Eric Salzano, and I've been around autism my entire life. My earliest memories, uh, my brother, who's three years older than me, impacted with autism. So I grew up with it my entire life, and uh, I think it kind of gives you a unique understanding. I also have a nephew disabled with autism also, and both of them are in the CSAC program. I kid around with people, and I say that uh, uh, my original job at CSAC was the moving man. Um, it lists CSAC as being started, which stands for Community Services for Autistic Adults and Children. It lists uh, the organization as being started in 1979, and that's when I became the moving man, uh, when my mother asked me to uh, set up the first house and get the furniture and put it all in place. And I did the first, second, and third house, and then they got somebody else. But... Uh, it, the genesis of the organization really started in the 1960s with parents getting together in living rooms, trying to advocate for their children and create a program where there wasn't one available. Back then, there was really very little uh, in the way of options for people with autism, and generally, people with disabilities altogether, there was very little. Uh, decisions were made that we had to start a program of some type. The start was getting little canisters and putting them at local businesses. Most of them are long gone. I can remember People's Drug Store, Heckinger's, and Citizens Bank of Maryland were 
corporate volunteers who put canisters in their businesses and people drop pennies and nickels and dimes. So it took about 10 years to really get some seed money to get the organization started. The pilot for the organization was run because there were people who said, uh, you know, you guys are crazy. You can't have people living in the community. Uh, people went to institutions. You can't have them living in a house next door to other people. And the other people have kids, and they're going to get upset if they move in. And the pilot was done in a uh, summer camp. Four cabins were rented, and uh, counselors were hired, and people with autism were lived for several weeks in the cabins. The IP plans were very simple. They were on a magnet on the refrigerator in the cabinet, cabin. The reinforcers were M&Ms. So if they did something right, you got up at 8 o'clock, you got a shower, you got three M&Ms. So that was the beginning of CSAC. And once it was piloted at the summer camp, it was rolled out to the first house, then the second house, and then the third house. Initially, there was opposition back in the early days. Like I said, people didn't want an organization like that next door to them. Now it's more embraced and uh, I think welcomed in the community. So a lot has changed over the years. Let me go to my slides here. We serve, CSAC serves a wide uh, variety of the spectrum of autism. We have incredibly high functioning people who have driver's licenses and you would probably wouldn't uh, know they were impacted with autism. If you saw them from 20 feet away, you would think they were a PhD at this uh, university. Uh, and we also have people, uh, uh, those people have driver's licenses, jobs, and the only help they might need is overnight. There might be one person, just one to three ratio, which means there's just somebody in the house to make sure they get dinner in the evening, and then everybody gets to bed, and there's no major problem. So one counselor, three people with autism, high functioning. We serve everything from high to people who also have a neurological problem. It takes two people just to be on either side of them to have locomotion to walk up a hallway. So there's some, there's some people with some very severe disabilities who are two to one, which basically means the, um, there's gonna be two caretakers for them, not 24 hours, but at least uh, 16 hours a day, they're gonna have two people caring for them. While they're asleep, the ratio goes a little lower. And everything in between, every type of functioning uh, in between that. And how do I move it? Um, see the arrows on the keyboard? Just, oh, just hit the arrow on the keyboard, mm -hmm. the down arrow. So the mission statement for CSAC, uh, to enable individuals with autism to achieve their highest potential and contribute as confident members of the community. And just a little bit about um, what services we have, because we're a service provider. This is where people with autism end up, you know, getting services. We have early intervention, which I think our youngest is 18 months old. So they go from about 18, as young as 18 months, getting early intervention, which is help one-to-one, -one, uh, making contact with the child. Uh, it can involve learning activities, uh, but, it, but it's very intensive, uh, up to about three years old, three to four years old. Then we have a school, Community School of Maryland. It's a 10-acre campus, and we have 45 students at the school. Doesn't sound like a lot, but 45 students with autism is probably like having a 450 student school. It can be a challenge. The classrooms are small. There are typically five kids per classroom. There's a teacher. And then most of those children are one-to-one. -one. And um, they range in age from seven years old up until 21 years old. We also offer residential services, which means when you're 21 years old and you graduate from the school, you could potentially apply to the residential services and have a house to live in, uh, be a member of the community, have your own room. Uh, CSAC basically provides everything, uh, transportation, uh, the plan, everything, the psychological plan. Uh, and there's also a vocational program for people to either work a job and have assistance and have a counselor to go to a job, or there's rehabilitation program or a training program where they could potentially learn skills that they could use in the workplace. Um, we have 
160 people in the residential program and we're growing. We have uh, about 155 people in the vocational program. Of the 155, approximately 40 work a job where they go to every day. A uh, portion of those are full-time. Probably three-quarters of those are full-time jobs. And then there's people that work part-time jobs. And it can, quite frankly, be as little as one day a week for four hours. That's a, that can be a big breakthrough for somebody with autism to even have an opportunity to get a job out in the community. So, and we also, I think we're probably unique in that we are going to serve people through their lifespan. So we don't take people when they're too old and put them in a nursing home. We have uh, four people 76 years old. I think one just turned 77. And we take care of them uh, for their entire lifespan. As I mentioned, CSAC was founded by uh, uh, family members who were concerned and wanted services that they didn't see out there. Well, we talked at lunch. Uh, in the 1960s, the options were an institution, which if you ever went there, uh, it looked like uh, kind of like Jack Nicholson in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, because I went there as a kid, and that's at least how I remember it. The guard or person with the white uniform and uh, people milling around cages with uh, uh, gowns that look like they're in the hospital, uh, things like that. So it was to, to uh, you know, put people in a community-based service, and uh, CSAC was the first to do that in the United States, very pioneer in that. CSAC's a private, nonprofit, uh, traditional, uh, nationally recognized leader in developing science-based, state-of-the-art uh, services for children diagnosed with autism. So what does that mean? You know, if I'm reading this, I'm saying, what does that mean, scientific-based? That means an IP plan. That means a very specific psychological plan, and they all differ. They're all unique to every individual because every individual is different. Different people are motivated by different things. Different people have different likes. Um, so it's all based on that uh, psychological program. Even putting people who we're going to put together. You have to put people who get along together. Uh, for example, some people with autism like making loud noises. Other people with autism can't stand hearing a loud noise. So it's very important that, that, that people are grouped together and that they have the IP plan and that IP plan is followed every day. And some of them are very, very specific as far as what needs to be done at what time, uh, how to handle things, uh, uh, what to do if somebody gets upset, that type of thing. Uh, CSAC's the only provider uh, to have a comprehensive program for individuals from early childhood through retirement. Uh, its services are modeled for other agencies in developing vocational programs and community-based housing and other related services. I already mentioned CSAC operates, uh, I said 100, we have 160, this slide says 157. We have 60 homes in the community and all different types of homes. Some of them are condominiums, some are townhomes, some are single family homes. We're actually uh, expanding and we have 10 homes that we're having built this fiscal year. In the next year, we'll have 10 more homes, we'll be up to 70. We're going to replace some existing homes, but honestly, the demand is great for services. The providers are almost busting at the seams uh, because there's huge demand uh, to serve people. Uh, CSAC has an accredited school, age 7 to 21. Uh, it's 45. Actually, we got a student today. I was mentioning at lunch a unique problem in that they're uh, Spanish speaking. We, we didn't know that until the last minute. So we have to have somebody there who can speak their native language. We have to have an aide. We rush somebody in HR who spoke Spanish over, and she's going to be the aide for that child until we get somebody up and trained who can speak Spanish so that that child can understand everything. The parents also couldn't speak any English. They showed up Friday to learn a little bit more about the program and, and couldn't speak a word of English. So that was a new challenge for us. And I mentioned 145 in vocational. Uh, different services provided, a community school of Maryland, residential support, and I mentioned the different 
levels of help that some need as little as one to three and some need as high as two to one. If I would say the average is probably one to one during the awake hours of the day. Uh, vocational support training, I put a little thing in there, empower vending because when we started really looking at jobs, and jobs are hard to find for people with autism, I'm gonna tell you right now. You can go to buy a Home Depot, they'll have a help wanted sign up, you walk in and bring the person with autism with you, I've gone myself and go to see the manager and oh, that sign's still out there? That job's gone, we don't have it anymore. It's very, very challenging to find jobs for people with autism. We have some, like I said, of 145 people, probably about 40 work a job. My nephew works on the red line on the Metro. He works a full-time job. He works basically almost, well, full-time for him six hours a day. But uh, it's very, very difficult. One of the things we did, we looked at tasks that people with autism can do. And without looking at what they can't do and what they're limited at, look at what they're strong at. Find, figure out what they enjoy doing. And one of the remedies we came up with was to start a small vending company, vending machines. The people in the program enjoyed stocking vending machines. They enjoyed interacting with vending machines. They enjoyed the bright colors and the lights on the vending machines. They enjoy traveling from site to site. You know, people with autism oftentimes don't like to be stuck in one place. You know, you or I, we might go to work for eight hours. We're fine with that. Um, but a lot of people impacted with autism, eight hours in one place is pretty tough. So traveling around and doing the vending machines worked real well. And that's, that's really blossomed as a business. And we have, I think, 39 or 40 sites now with vending machines. And it actually, it's an opportunity for the people to take pride because they're the owners of the business. We're not going and begging for somebody for a job. And really, one of the trends, I think, of the future is going to be, um, we mentioned somebody likes working in a garden center. Instead of going and begging the garden center for a job, is we're going to own our own garden center. And the, the individuals are going to be the owners of the garden center, and they're going to work it. And that's, that's kind of the path of the trends of the future. Uh, sustainability uh, is super important. Channels of income. Uh, anybody who knows about funding, most of the funding comes from the state. And where does the state get the money? They come up with 50%. Another 50% is pushed down from the federal government. So it probably makes up 90-something percent of our funding. So big challenge, you know. Uh, if the government gets in a little bit of a bind, it can be a real problem. Um, some of the challenges we have, I know everybody wants to raise the minimum wage. Montgomery County, they raised the minimum wage. And guess what that did to us? We're funded at this amount. We're not funded this amount plus they raise the minimum wage. So those type of things are big, big challenges for the organization and this, it's all the service providers, not just CSAC. So um, uh, there's no way for us to raise our, you know, we're not a, a pizza parlor, you know. The minimum wage goes up, a pizza place can just raise the price 50 cents. We can't do that, we're stuck. So those are the type of, type of things that are challenging for us. In our county, uh, they came up with a plan where they wanted everybody to have some extra sick leave, and they passed a bill. You know, they passed a magic wand and a bill passed, and uh, the sick leave went up. How much we had to pay all our employees? Quick calculation, it cost us $160,000. $160,000 we don't have. Nobody's funding it for us. There wasn't anything in the bill that said, oh, give them $160,000, they can't pay for it. So those are the type of things that we have to look at when we look at uh, sustainability of the organization. Channels of income, creating job opportunities, we talked about that. Consolidation of providers, at least the auditor tells me that, uh, that we're in healthy shape when they do our audit every year, but they think that the trend is gonna be that providers are gonna consolidate at some point. At the very least, I think what's gonna happen is uh, sharing of resources, whether it's one training center, um, whether it's real estate, but some type of resource sharing is gonna, is gonna be more prevalent in the future than it is now. So another challenge. And I wanted to look at a couple, somebody had said something about a couple case studies. They're really all unique. Everybody with autism, it's, every single person is unique that's in the program. There's no two people that are alike. 
Um, this person here, Stacy, joined the program in 2012 and had training. Um, this is an example of a person that I mentioned that didn't like being on the job one place at one time. He's actually doing Empower Vending now, and he loves it. I wish I had a picture of him with his uh, red shirt, and he, we have a hat. Uh, but he's doing a great job and thriving incredibly. Interestingly enough, this same individual, quick story about him, and I won't read through the whole thing. Um, the place that he worked, the owner gave him a $5 bill every pay period. So he got a little bit of a check and he got a $5 bill. And one time the owner said, uh, hey, you did a great job. I'm going to give you a $50 bill. And the individual was incredibly upset and had a very bad behavior. The owner couldn't understand why. I normally give him $5. This time I gave him $50 and he screamed and was all upset and very emotional about it. And the fact of the matter was the individual wanted the $5 bill. The monetary thing meant nothing to him. He wanted the one that he normally got, which had a picture of Abraham Lincoln on it. He didn't want a piece of paper with another picture he wasn't used to. So yeah, it's kind of hard for some people to understand, but that, that's the way autism works. He wanted that consistency and he wanted it the same. Charles and Paul, this is a funny story. Uh, I'll start at the back side of the story. I had an art person come in uh, who runs an art gallery down in Washington, D.C., where I guess uh, people that probably make a lot more money than I do go and look at art and sip wine and have a little bit of cheese. And he says, you have originals. You have a Charles and Paul's original works on the walls here at CSAC. You know how much money this is worth? There's probably 100 drawings that these uh, between these two individuals that are down in the halls. And apparently there's people that pay, um, the one guy gets, I think, uh, maybe four or five hundred dollars for, for his artwork now, which is fantastic. So um, they're, they're in an art program and they're, they're known artists in their little circle. And the guy says, in New York, this piece could get fifteen hundred dollars and, and, and everything else. So I guess the moral of the story is, is finding the strengths and finding what people with disabilities can do well. They might not be able to do everything well, but there's something they may be able to do a lot better than I can. And for these two individuals, it's art. And they do very well, and they do their art, and they do it one day a week. Uh, the one we have to keep from being too prolific, he would probably make 10 things a day if we let him. So we kind of slow him down and pace it out. Uh, we have some individuals who do photography. We started a, uh, and some have won awards. They've been in the Washington Post. One went to the cherry festival a few years ago and everybody else was taking pictures of the cherry trees. And he took a picture of a spider web and a spider in one of the trees. So that's what he saw. So it was looking at, looking at the world through the eyes of somebody who has autism. So, and, and that's, and the people who do that, they love doing it. And really, another trend is, is uh, and it's in really the state regulations too, is about choices for people with autism. So it's not, um, well, we got a program and uh, every Tuesday night, uh, uh, a white van's gonna come take everybody bowling. That's what we do Tuesday nights. That's the old fashioned way. The new way is, what do you wanna do? We have seven different activities. Do you want to go to the museum? Do you want to see an exhibit? Um, is it Halloween time? Do you want to go pick your own pumpkin and carve it? That type of thing. So it's about choices. It's about being a member of the community is the, is the way of the future. Looking back um, the way things were, in the early 70s, I don't know if people know this, there were programs that used uh, punishment. You know, CSEC, was founded on using positive reinforcers. I kid around, I say M&Ms. I think some people still get M&Ms. My brother still wants M&Ms out of the vending machine. But there were organizations that tried punishment. Uh, there were electric shock collars where the person in charge could just press a little, look like your little TV clicker and the person got X number of volts and jumped and everything. Um, we have an individual in our program who was in a program up in New England where uh, they would water, they would hose him down with a wet hose. They'd drag him into the bathroom and that was his punishment. And when he came to CSAC, every time they tried to take him to the bathroom, he would start shaking and get upset. He thought he was gonna get the hose. So those have all gone by the wayside. It's positive reinforcers, it's IP plan, it's being integrated into the community. 
integrated into the workforce as much as possible. And, and I think that's, that's basically it. Looking forward to the Q&A. Folks have that are passed out. I'll have a question while while she's writing. Um, thinking about capacity for one organization like yours um, versus need, uh, is there also a trend in the future to think about creating um, either training products or facilitating networks of organizations like yours, or some way to disseminate at scale these same ideas so that? You know, employers, for example, can get training on awareness of things like the $50 example uh, to make opportunities more easily to come by. That's a good question, and we had set up uh, basically an uh, organization that will try to disseminate that information. It was called the International Autism Initiative, and it's an entity that we've set up to be able to disseminate information and, and help other programs get started. One of the challenges is, because um, a lot of people think a lot of parents think, and I'm not knocking physicians, but physicians and lawyers fall into this category. They got the uh, I'll go it alone mode, which is I'm going to get a pile of money, and then my brother or my other sibling, their sibling or something's going to take care of them, and that's a hard road to go. So being a part of a program is really essential. So I'd advise anybody who's a parent Get involved in a program. Get on the board of directors or whatever. Be involved, and that's your best outlet because you can't go it alone, I don't believe. Another example of community. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Okay, the first question is, do you have a wait list, and if so, how do you address that wait list? It's interesting. We're, we're probably also unique in that we're one of the only providers that only deals with autism. We do not deal with other developmental disabilities, only autism. Probably, I'm going to say, about 30% of the people who apply for the program, maybe 40, are admitted to the program. There are some where there's, uh, for example, if they have a severe medical issue that's beyond our ability to care for. Um, it, it would create a challenge. Or if there was some type of behavior that was extremely, um, that was high, like a violence or something like that. Or, you know, um, we had somebody we couldn't take recently, and all they wanted to do when they rode in an automobile was take over the wheel and, you know, try to make the car crash. And they wanted to stick up pens and pencils in their ear till blood came out. So there's certain behaviors that are, that are very difficult that, that we're unable to handle, so about 40%. And the follow-up question on this one um, is, what's the difference between your sort of non-government costs and government funding, and what are you thinking about to close that gap? Well, we're at a little bit of an advantage, and I'll give my father some credit. He said, if you're gonna start a program and you're gonna be in the Washington metropolitan area, you better own your real estate Otherwise, over this time goes by, you'll be priced out of the market. So I think we have a cost advantage over some providers in that we own our real estate portfolio, including our headquarters and school and our houses, and that helps some. But fundraising, uh, we put in for every grant we can put in. We have several corporate corporations that help us out, and some on an annual basis. I don't want to mention the names. I don't want to be an advertisement for them. But, uh, well, I do, but, you know, uh, uh, you could see on our website. But, uh, and, and fundraising in general. We do, a, we do an annual fundraising event where we try to uh, raise additional money. And additional money for what? Well, besides being able to function, you know, the state funding doesn't get a vacation. We make sure everybody in the program gets some type of vacation, whether they go to the beach or the mountains or something like that. That's not funded. Uh, things like having birthday parties or, or Christmas or holiday parties or things like that. So the extra things is what we're able to achieve with uh, things like fundraising. I have two more. Um, so the next one is, 
How are adults with autism involved in leadership of CSAC? Do, um, do self-advocates serve on the board or contribute to the vision? Great question, and absolutely. We have a person named Hans who's in the program. He's also on the board of directors. He shows up in a suit and tie. He participates in the board of directors meeting, and he often asks very relevant questions. He thanked me last time for at the last board meeting, and he thanked the entire board for giving excellent care. Uh, he tells me he wants a Jeep Cherokee at every meeting. He doesn't have a driver's license <laughs> at this point. And I guess I'll tell him, well, you know, maybe in the future, I don't know. Um, he did get a go-kart adventure, but, but uh, his thoughts do matter and how he feels matters. Um, he heard about us buying new houses and he said, I don't want to move out of my house. So he has genuine care and concern for uh, the people in the program and he is an advocate uh, for the and a voice for people in the program. Okay, and last question, um, you mentioned services through old age. Can you give us just like one or two examples of elder care, sort of end of life care? Those are things traditionally very hard to access for autistic That's individuals. That's extremely difficult. And we have a person right now who's in Georgetown Hospital who's 76 years old, who's very, very ill. And um, uh, that's, that's very difficult. Uh, we're, what we're doing is we're accommodating our housing. So we're in the process of uh, remodeling several houses to accommodate uh, potentially people in a wheelchair, uh, people who may need the thing that slides along the ceiling to be able to help them to get up to the shower and, and, and people when they can't walk and things like that. So we are, we are addressing that. Is there a lot of funding for that? Uh, no, there's not extra funding for that. So that's something we're kind of on our own. But the opposite end of that, let's say we were a heartless organization and we just said, well, you know what? You get a little older and... Uh, you can't really take care of yourself. Uh, go to a nursing home. It's not our problem. The funding level that they would get if they were removed from the program is $77.01 a day. Might have gone up a tiny bit this year. That would be what the federal government payment would allow them for a nursing home, which means can you imagine a person impacted with autism? Maybe they're nonverbal. Can you imagine what type of life they would have in a nursing home at the bare minimal care um, level. So keeping uh, the people in the program with dignity throughout their lifespan is critical to our mission. Thank you very much. All right, and then I will welcome Dr. Lee back to the podium. Um, I have already given her introduction, so I will just um, preview this by saying that this is a collaboration between the Department of Population, Family, and Reproductive Health, as well as the Wendy Clegg Center, uh, because that department uh, employs demographers and other folks uh, with expertise in the area of demography and projections. So, welcome back. Hi, it's me again. <coughs> Tim, Fong, um, Tim, Tim Fong cannot do the presentation due to uh, international travels. So, I am back to do this. In the first talk, we, re we reviewed the existing observed prevalence. <clears throat> observe. Now we are going to talk about projections. And I know we want to get right into the numbers. So let's get started. I want to talk about where do we get the data to do this projection. So totally eight surveillance societies participate in this projection study that we are going to, to present you. We present to you. So these are here, these eight sites, and we thank them very much for giving us the permission to access their data. The second I want to remind you is that for this projection analysis, we do the common area. What I mean is, remember we just look at the, the province that we say there's 14 sites, 11 sites, 10 sites. But the catchment area within each site is not necessarily all the same across each severance point, nor the state of the study site. So it, for the projection, it's very important because now we want to look at how that trend is going to be in the future. We want to make sure we have the common area, meaning that the same area we are talking about. 
Therefore, some of the prevalence rate you will see in this common area may not be the same as the prevalence reports we just reviewed. Remember that cross-section at each severance time point. That's what I want to make it clear. If for this projection, we use county labels data for this. Um, I actually just got the number for the other county, but I forgot. This is the aging code did to you. I think it's the hundreds counties. Um, so you, we also use the US census data to estimate the counts in the birth cohorts and the population size in these communities. So Becky has been doing about, Becky Harrington has been doing above and beyond work and now he, she knows so much about census data. We are afraid the Census Bureau is coming to, to, to hire her, to steal her from us. <laughs> She's so good. So the modeling, so Qingfeng has been doing the modeling. Um, and then before we talk about the model, the methodology, the mathematician equation part, which we are not going to talk much at all, I want to talk about the definition, what do we do? Adults, in this presentation and in this analysis, when I say adults, not refer to age 20 to 70. That is the, how we um, do that. So why we pick not 20 to 70 years? Because we want to project the rate up to year 2030. So, for, uh, so we want to talk about in 2030, who are the adults? So these adults will be the birth year from 1960 to 2010. In other words, we want to make sure these people are already born when we talk about adults. We are not going to talk about 2050 because some of the adults wouldn't have not been born yet, right? So here, the uh, other that's an um, approach we did. For the first year between 1992, we apply surveillance year 2000's estimate. Why? Because the surveillance year 2000 is the first prevalence estimate in other network, and it's also the first population-based prevalence estimate. For people who are older than 1992, birth, birth year 1992, we just assume they are having the same prevalence rate. For 92 to 2002, we Athens already have the data of the prevalence. So we just apply and our Athens observe estimate. So for the future birth year, that's 2003 to 2010, the project rate, what, what do I mean the project rate? We use this data from the eight sites combined and using census data about their social demographic distribution and then including the sex and racial ethnicity, use those information to help us to do this projection. So those are the information I just want to pull out there. So I want also to point out one thing because that's going to affect the data on. You see the figure, it's for those first year between 1960 to 1992, those is a huge birth, you know, range, right? So the study year 2000s, and I estimate it's going to weigh more in the adult projection because you have a more birth cohort there. Today, this is not epimetric course, or it is another class for biostatistics. So we're not going to talk about how is the Beijing hierarchical models, but believe me, that's what we did. <laughs> There's just such things called that. So the, for the modeling, I just want to make a huge assumption here. I think it, a mind has already touched a little bit on this. We want to make, when we talk about ASD prevalence rate, mortality rate, and social demographic characteristic, remember when people will move in and out of the catchment area, right? So it's in migration, out migration. Our assumption is that we assume this immigration and out migration, their prevalence rate, or autism ASD prevalence rate, their mortality rate are the same. Otherwise, this projection will not hold. <clears throat> we also could not account for some of the effect 
um, those you know the, the the effects due to this future change because we don't know what is going to change in the future. So we the projection we are going to see did not accounting for public awareness. We know that awareness have a lot to do with prevalence, right? Because higher prevalence with a, in the uh, earlier sign, early recognition, or early identification, or early you know screening. We also did not. Uh, account for the diagnosis criteria change. We know in the future, the diagnosis criteria may change, such as we already see that at the first time we have a DSM-5 estimate. We also assume that one have a diagnosis, when they grow into the adulthood, the diagnosis doesn't go away. We assume it's just going to stay there. And we don't, and we also, not accounting for that screening said right now if everybody now we have a new policy in place say everybody has to do the screening then you will see the increase dramatically right so all of this we are not accounting for also diagnosing um, practice and also the true causes all this we did not take into account in this projection Due to, I'm talking about future changes, okay, in this area. Okay, here is our projection, the first one. This is a prevalence trend, but eight year old. But I thought that you were going to talk about adults. So this is all going to become adults. So how do we review these slides? Again, on the y-axis, prevalence is go by per thousand. So in the red lines, is right at the left side, this clear color here. Those are observed prevalence, which we already know from other network. So we already know this. And remember, you were probably said, well, I thought the Maryland is a slightly higher than the combined. Remember earlier we talked about that? So why it doesn't look that way? Remember, we used the different denominator, which is the population here. In this projection, we name it to a study participating site. Within each participating site, we also want a common area, meaning that at the different surveillance point, they will be have a common area rather than the cross-sectional estimate as the Adam report. So you will see that slightly different. For, and of course, other modeling assumption would affect that as well. So here is observed prevalence. But right here, the, after this, the surveillance year, the 2030, so let's look at the U, um, Maryland, who's, which is the blue line. In 2030s, we project autism prevalence, given all the assumptions we just reviewed. It's going to be 3.4% for children the eight years old, in this case, we define as eight years old. So first, for the old, old sites, when the old sites I refer to, meaning the eight participating sites we just review, but not necessarily the whole US. But why we don't talk about the whole US? Remember, the participating sites, in, in fact, seems to have more resources, and they as compared to non-participating side in the whole United States community. In other words, this, this participating side, those com common area we just talked about, they are not representative of the U.S. communities. So that's why we want to, we don't think it's right for us to project outside of this eight participating sites. So when I say all sites here refer to these eight sites. So those are all the prevalence rates for eight years old. So how about the adults? So here is just a review. In Maryland, that's 3.4% uh, uh, 3 or, or one in 29, which we just observed in the, in the slide before. But the U.S. community in these eight sites, that's a 4.2% or 42,000 or one in 24. How about the adults in 2030? 
what are the numbers? So again, the adults here for the projection re refer to ages 20 to 70. In Maryland, that's 7.1 per thousand, or one in 140. So the first come to your mind is, well, I thought we just see the eight years old is going to be, eight year old actually, it's 2% in Maryland. Why for adults, it's 7.1% per thousand, which is, oh, sorry, 7.1 per thousand. It's far lower, right? So remember, the, when we define ASD cases, we, we base on their identified diagnosis, when they are identified. Older ages, they may not be identified. So as such as a 70 years old, they probably, they, if they are true cases, but they will just never been identified. That is the possibility. A lot of possibilities are partially because we estimate, that we do the projection for the older cohorts. Remember, we just say, for those who are born before 1992, we just assume the prevalence rate is the same youth in the Athens first, prevalence rate. We get that? So that will be lower than most recent one. In other words, the most recent, that 2% in Maryland in 2030, how old is that going to be? So, so in 2030, our 20, um, our 20, 2014, the first year will be, sorry, I did, did, did do this. The first year will be 2006, right? So in 2030, that person will be 24 years old. So what I'm trying to, to tell you is the older population do not forget it to carry, they carry a lot of weight as well for age 20 to 70. So we project the adult population based on the census, the U.S. census of Maryland by county, right? We project it will be going to 5.3 million in 2030. So if you calculate that, that the projected count with the autism will be almost 38,000 in the year of 2030 in Maryland. Um, how about in the U.S. communities, in this eight participating site that we were just mentioned? So those are the states we will review again, and as you see, <coughs> it, the projected number is 87 per thousand, or one in, one, one in 115. So the projected adult population in among the uh, among these eight sites combined, that's about forty-seven millions. So with this projected prevalence rate, we estimate in these eight sites, it will be about four four hundred eleven, you know, four eleven thousand, almost half a million on these eight sites. So that tell us what are the numbers? So why, why we want why we want to care, right? We definitely have to care. We should care, and we do care. So people, we talk about. Uh, so other than just one, you call it population based estimate. Is that all real? So there is another two. Uh, I just want to make a, some comparison just for you to get a sense. This is, uh, most of you, pop, many of you probably already heard of, but there are two surveys called, uh, one is NSCH, one is CSHCN, one is with a space, okay. Um, the first one is NSCH is representative of U.S. children. The second one is children with special health care needs. So the survey is not absolutely the same, but you can see, the second one, which is the children with a special health care need, this survey is probably going to have a lower estimate. 
because um, that is the more for targeted uh, for the for us uh, with such a special need one. So let's review this figure that was already published. So what do we see in the increase? So I want to remark, give you a little bit background information about these national surveys. They do cross-sectional, asking parents or caregiver whether the child had been diagnosed by a healthcare provider with autism, autism spectrum disorder, BDD, or, okay, or ASD. So here, it's a cross-sectional. This is not like a birth cohort moving forward, as we just did. So in the cross-sectional, the, the, for the NSCH, that is in two, 2011 to 2012, not one time point. For the child age 0 to 17, here are the cumulative, cumulative instances. So let's look at the NSCH first. What do you see, which is the solid nine? The southern night, this is OASD, this is mild ASD, moderate ASD, and severe ASD. We know nowadays, remember in the first talk, now we were able to identify, most of the most of identified cases do not have intellectual disability. In some way, that's indicating we are identifying more mild form of ASD. So that this slide just tell you, yes, that is the case, right? Those are the cases. So the increases is probably due to more identification for the mild form of ASD. So why projected count, count, count? So many students living with ASD, they, of course, they need services, they need support. But now they are going to grow into um, the adulthood and adolescence. So why this counts so important for us? For governments, they definitely want to know so they can prepare in advance. There are so many things. So what are allocated resources and services, service provider? We know what is coming, the school systems, policymakers and community leaders, and, and for scientists, that when we do research, we know what kinds of uh, the landscape we were looking at, uh, what are the projected uh, numbers we were looking at. Okay, so that is my projection. You were probably said, well, I want more. Why don't you talk about more detail? It's a believe me, I think I just spoke with Dr. Linda about this. This takes more than an effort of a village of people. This is, this is huge and enormous just to put the data together. So for people who know what this is doing, and we cannot, th I cannot think enough for Maryland and Argentina, especially Becky Harrington. Uh, it's amazing to put the data together. And I want to you know, thank the WK Wendy Clark Center for all the supports and resources. And again, Michelle Landron is amazing. And CDC, uh, the CDC and CBDD the artisan team, and also the eight sites who give grant us the permission to do this projection project, they contribute their data. And also Amy, Amy Joyce at uh, Parfen, this is the professor, uh, we, we our gratitude to her for her advice and guidance in how to do the projection. She's a demographer and really guide us through about how to do these kinds of a projection. We owe her a great debt of gratitude. And, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Li Ching. Before break, I want to ask one question from the audience with a little um, modification as well. Um, and so to start it, you know, for the age eight results, you were able to show what the trend of projection looked like amongst eight-year-olds from um, a certain date until 2030. But then for the adulthood results, you were only showing the 2030 results. So have you put it into context of what that, what that um, projection number would have looked like, you know, if you were looking at 2020 or 2010 um, to see, you know, is it rising even though it looks different than the eight-year-old comparison? So yes, that's, um, that's a great question. Actually, initially I was really looking forward to do that as well. So. Due to, we, we actually was trying to put the census data to moving that, and it, it, it ended up taking the enormous amount of effort. And also the projection, when we put into the models, the, 
the Beijing models I earlier just mentioned, when we put in the ear, actually, because the projecting factors have so many, it become really thin. So the confidence interval become really wide. And that is actually the reason we try to resolve the before we can put the adult number like a gra figure like this. I know when you think, well, but you have a millions of population here for you to do the projection. I cannot believe you even still talk about sample size too small. And that's the reality. Um, so we are trying to solve that um, methodology issues. We don't know how to bring in other, other factors and expertise to, 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 to do that. But that actually is the only reason. OK. Between. And so then the, the additional question is, um, and it's related to the other kinds of data that you showed from um, uh, additional national data sets, um, for your projections, uh, did you make the assumption that there were no newly diagnosed people added after age eight? Correct. Um, be, and so can we then rightly assume that these are um, underestimates of projected prevalence, assuming that the cumulative incidence continues to increase after age eight? Um, I reflect for, that person's question. For, first, that, first um, these two national surveys are not related to adding the number I was presenting. And the second, yes, we did. We assume those who are diagnosed by age A, um, you know, you will have that. But you, if anybody diagnosed at the age 10, or because they're homeschooling, they never really come to the school system, and yes, it's possible we will miss them. But on the other hand, the same vice versa, for people who were over, you know, who, people who have other coexisting conditions, or misdiagnosed, then can also count, you know, you can count them in each, we count it in here, but maybe later on their diagnosis can go out to the other way, and then primary diagnosis can become others. So, so it can go both way, but for this projection, we just assume after age A, no new diagnosis. And we also assume once the adult determine that diagnosis because Adam doesn't identify those already have a diagnosis. Adam, you, you know, the expert reviewer, they can also identify the new one who never were being diagnosed. That's the population base. So the assumption, you are right, the assumption being in that um, no new cases. So possibly it can be underestimate or overestimate in the true cases or in, but again, we don't know what are the true cases uh, it's going to be. Everything's a projection here. Great, thank you. Thank you. So we'll try to be as quick as possible with a break. So I am gonna say everyone, we will start the panel right at 3.20, which is about a 15 minute delay. Um, but let's start right at 3.20 so that we can give as much time to the panel discussion as possible. Thank you. So I'm going to give a abbreviated introduction of our panelists, but I don't want to go without doing that because I think it's really exciting that we have all these folks joined together in one room to have a discussion together. And then I want to remind you, if you have questions for the panelists, please write them on the cards. If you want a card and you don't have one, wave, please, and our assistants will see you and come and, and bring you a card um, so that we can do this productively. Um, so our panelists include <laughs> um, kindly very close together. Um, uh, Mr. Salzano, our speaker that I introduced before, but also Dr. Terry Savage. Terry, you want to say hello? Yep. Um, who is the Acting Executive Director of Special Education for the Howard County Public School Systems. And she has been working in the field of special education for 23 years, has had multiple roles in four different Maryland counties, um, and has contributed to various state and local initiatives in special education, including curriculum and instruction, assessment, and professional learning. And then I would next like to introduce Dr. Maureen Van Stone. Uh, Maureen is with the Kennedy Krieger Institute. She is Associate Director for the Maryland Center for Developmental Disabilities, or what we around here call IMSED, uh, as, and is the founding director of Project HEAL, which stands for Health, Education, Advocacy, and Law, which is Maryland's only comprehensive medical legal partnership. And, and several of you have, um, have been an intern or somehow worked with the HEAL Project uh, since its inception. And she 
as also the vice chair of the board of directors for the Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates and serves on two advisory committees for the National Council on Disability and has served as an expert on the United States Department of Labor Office and Disability Employment Policy Community of Practice. And next is Ms. <coughs> Rhonda Workman. Rhonda, say hello. <laughs> Um, she's the Director of Federal Programs with the Maryland Department of Health Developmental Disabilities Administration. She has 30 years of health and human services experience, leading, managing, planning, analyzing, and developing programs and policies related to Medicaid, <clears throat> home and community-based service waivers, state services, federal demonstration projects, quality systems, uh, rebalancing of long-term supports, and delivering services to people with disabilities, both at the state and the local levels. And then lastly, Mr. Zoja Sachs, Zoja say hello, um, who is a certified rehabilitation uh, counselor and is currently the um, manager for the programs on education at Towson University's Husband Center for Adults with Autism, uh, where he also directs the work readiness program that teaches autistic, autism courses in the College of Health Professions. Um, before working at Towson, he was at the Maryland Division of Rehabilitation Services, supporting transition um, of youth and community living and employment programs, and also provides professional development workshops around the country. So welcome to all of you. Uh, we, like, as I said, it's a real privilege to have each of you here and the perspectives that you bring. And I think I can kick us off with a question and sort of help to, to go through each of you giving kind of your perspective. And then what we'll try to do is mix in any community um, audience questions at the same time rather than just going through the list of my questions. So Nicole, if you don't mind, if you can kind of keep a look for me, if somebody raises their hand and brings one up, make sure I don't miss it if I'm looking down or looking at the panelists. Um, I appreciate that. So why don't we go ahead and start? So I think um, as it relates to autism and, and the things that we've heard today um, might be part of a, a stem for how you answer this question, but don't feel like it has to be based on that. Uh, we would love to hear what you think are the biggest challenges from your organization or your perspective and role uh, within um, autism services um, or community uh, engagement right now. Um, what have been the challenges in the last five years and how do you anticipate those challenges growing or changing in the next five years? And yeah, we'll start with you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so um, in reflecting on the data, clearly for us as a local school district, uh, the challenge is the growth, and it is um, alarming. In fact, when I looked at the data just before coming here, our numbers from today, and if I go back a couple of years, the increase is well over 30% just in our local school district. And so we can attribute that to a number of things. Clearly, there could be students uh, within our district who were identified at an early age and have matriculated to our system. We might have children who moved in from other locals or other states. But at any rate, they sit in our seats and they deserve to be educated. And so the challenge uh, that I see, number one, is going to be space. As we are looking at how to maintain highly inclusive classrooms, which we pride ourselves on in our particular local district, or whether or not we're looking at how to expand the continuum of services, space is going to be something we have to consider. And I bring that issue of space up for this reason simply. Number one, it's just not about the children being before us, but it's about the team of adults who also must occupy that space. And that brings me to just another challenge that I'll mention before I uh, allow other panelists to speak, and that is all of the adults operating as a team require a high level of quality professional learning. And so, that is a challenge on many different levels. I won't go into all, but just the access to all of those adults, the differentiation that is needed in terms of experience, et cetera. So capacity is going to be a, a big challenge in terms of knowledge and skill when I speak of capacity. Um, over the last five years, aging population for providers has been a challenge. I talked about that a little bit and how do, what does that look like and how do we accommodate that. Funding challenges, I believe that's always been there and that always will be there. Uh, regulatory changes um, or regulations that are 
are different from county and state. They sometimes conflict with each other. You wouldn't think so, but they do. And then the next five years, like I said, funding's always gonna be there. Increase in housing costs makes it more difficult for providers to operate. I think I read the other day, Maryland housing prices are projected to move up at 4% next year. Uh, who knows, but that's what the projection is. Uh, hiring and training qualified associates and rising minimum wage actually hurts providers and an improving economy. Uh, a lot of good people can be attracted away to a higher paying job. Believe it or not, better economy hurts providers. So I think from Kennedy Krieger Institute's perspective, you know, we have uh, been known in the community as a pediatric and adolescent institution serving um, a broad spectrum of children with disabilities. Um, but what we're finding now is that we are seeing more and more young adults uh, on the autism spectrum, and we're having difficulty in terms of transitioning um, some of our students into post-secondary educational opportunities or training opportunities. Um, we're also seeing challenges with transitions um, to healthcare. Um, so if they've been seeing a developmental pediatrician at our hospital from birth through 18, um, it's difficult to find healthcare providers in the community to transition these children or young adults to. And then also transition as it relates to um, finances and um, these young adults on the autism spectrum um, getting and maintaining um, competitive employment um, and taking control of their finances and having their family members sort of take a step back. Um, and some of the challenges that we've seen in our patient population, our student population, requires us to to think creatively about how best to prepare them um, for those education, employment, and financial transitions um, as we continue to see our patient population grow above the age of 18. And I represent the Developmental Disabilities Administration. So we have um, what some people would think is the adult service delivery system. So with, with the prevalence in the school system and the rise that continue to come up, it's going to enter our, our service delivery system. But we actually support adults um, and children. So we do all ages. Um, and so the challenges, whether you're talking about funding and waiting lists, all those are just going to continue to be compounded uh, because as we support not only individuals with um, autism, but also individuals with various developmental disabilities disabilities. Um, and so that's going to be a, a challenge. And as we look at the prevalence of autism, we also have um, people aging. So people in our service delivery system that are currently um, receiving services are going to need more and more services. Um, and the, the um, interesting part about the, the last presentation, when I'm thinking about the 37,000 adults in 2030, um, the challenges that we're going to have there are going to continue to increase as we look as more opportunity to support people in the community. And when we think about community, we don't want to visit the community. We don't want like support and services going around in different areas of the community, but to have truly community membership. And so as we think about things and look at the future, I think some of the things we need to consider is that not one state or federal program is going to be able to meet all the needs. It's really going to have to be a community, a statewide effort that we really embrace and support people with all different types of disabilities and needs, um, whether it's employment or community and housing. So I think those are challenges that we're all going to have to, to look at. Uh, I, I'm going to second some of the things that other people have said in terms of volume. So at the Huston Center, we have adults from the community coming from all over to take our programs. And um, there's so many adults who want to do our programs that we're completely out of spots. We're going to have to move to some kind of lottery system, which is um, really awful to think about. Um, I think also another uh, huge challenge for us is policies and when policies are not flexible. So um, I, I, I think it's going to be really important for, for in terms of servicing these adults to look at, at those kind of um, policy issues. Um, I can give one example. Um, in the introduction, you mentioned I, want, I run a work readiness program, so we're not a service provider. Um, but what we've found is that autistic adults often need more time to get ready for um, when they're going to go into vocational type of program. They need more time to adjust to workplace expectations, practice social communication skills, and do some of that discovery um, that Dr. Um, Solanzo was talking about earlier to make those good matches for employment. Um, unfortunately, so we have this great work readiness program, but we don't um, match what um, is considered <laughs> by policy 
to be work adjustments. So our families can't use some of the funding they may have access to for our program. Um, if they could, then Towson could hire more of me and um, expand those slots. So that's kind of where the policy comes in. And then uh, a few people also mentioned capacity in terms of providers. Um, so the way that our, our model works is, is very innovative. And we have these programs that our adults are coming for. And then our students are in the program with them. And some of them, yes, are training to be you know in a disability-related career. But actually, a lot of them are not. Um, we get students from all different majors doing service learning projects with our autistic adults. And um, I think where that makes the dent is, I think of the example earlier about the, the boss who gave the $50 and didn't realize why that was so upsetting. Or you know when you're talking about people living in the community and, and the family that's across the street. So those are the, the students that we need to reach because they're the ones who are going to leave us and go into the community and know what autism means and why this diversity is, is so valuable to society to have people living in, the, in society with them. Um, but you know that's, that's the capacity question, is, is needing the funding and the policy to build all of that up. Thank you. I'm going to read one of the questions that came from our audience and then um, with hopefully their forgiveness expand the question a little bit. Uh, because the question is specific to Dr. Savage, what is being done in the public school system to help integrate students with developmental disabilities into the society of their peers? What more can and should be done to bring this integration into the public school systems? And my modification would be, that's true at every age, the school system is one place, uh, but generally when we think about fellow employees amongst adults or fellow roommates amongst housing situations, what can be done to really promote this idea of a society of peers? I think um, I mentioned it earlier in terms of um, how we as local education uh, systems create opportunities for inclusion, right? So we want to start early on, uh, as soon as we receive our students, integrating them into natural situations in the classroom, uh, on the playground, at lunch. These are the types of situations that must be structured, they must be facilitated, they must be monitored, and the information that we get from that then should inform us, the practitioner. So, so how do we need to differentiate for that particular child? To your point, where there's nothing, there's no one size fits all, there's no two children alike. We're never going to be able to build enough programs, if you will, to accommodate all the different strengths of the children we serve. So we must be flexible in our thinking and work from a foundation where we're able to uh, look at some of the programs or programming that we have in place and figure out how to replicate that. Great, thanks. Others have thoughts on that general topic? I would just add that I think that some of the services that we provide through our service delivery system that are offered um, by um, CSAC and other agencies are really going to be critical. So are they services where we're doing employment skills? Are there services where we're helping people to integrate in the community, to develop and have those opportunities to experience and, and, and take risk and, and actually have some failures in the community where they're trying to interact with their peers or, or the, um, the community as a whole? And so as we look at services and we look at best practice or innovative models um, that, that are being um, either currently in practice or other ones that are being developed, how can we further that so that we truly have true experience with, with community and people and we partner um, versus, um, again, doing things in isolation and more of a congregate setting. Yeah, I'll just speak to it very quickly. Um, that's, that's the heart of what we're doing is the peer education piece. Um, so, you know, the, one of the, the, the biggest things that my college students say to me is, oh, I wish I could have done this when I was younger. Um, or why didn't I meet my autistic friends earlier? Why did it take this long? So I think, yeah, just continuing to try to do it younger and younger, but also at that college point is, is um, a great point to do it too, because that's when they are starting to think, okay, I'm going into business, or I'm going into science, or I'm going to be a preschool teacher. So we want them to have that exposure and those, those opportunities so that, that, that they're getting that um, integration. Thank you. 
Um, I'll, I'll actually, please I'll, go I'll, ahead. Yeah, I'll yeah. Add just a little bit there. Um, just to highlight a couple of um, opportunities that we have at the local level, and I, I don't think that we're. Um, unique in this and in that we offer a couple of programs for students who are older so for example we have a program uh, called project project search and so we're able to help uh, young adults integrate into the workplace and build those skills but one of the things that I wanted to point out is I do think there has to be a shift um, in how we think as uh, special educators and related service providers and that shift has to has to do with the big T and the little T because I sometimes I feel like in our educational settings we're so focused on that age 13 14 and beyond when there is so much more that we could be doing as soon as our children hit kindergarten and, and before but kindergarten and first grade especially where we can make sure that they have elementary experiences where they're focused on the things that they enjoy the strengths uh, some of those pre-work skills that that um, will be helpful for them to have if we start working on them earlier in our schools. So I did want to highlight that because I think that's a missed opportunity and something that we're beginning to take a, a, a stronger look at. Can I have one more thing? Please, Rhonda. Yeah. Um, so one other thing, just to build on that, um, one of the things that we've been really focusing on in our transformation relates to the community practice of supporting families. And one of the things we talk about is the life course framework. And so when you're talking about with people with disabilities and you need to look at the whole lifespan, so we're talking about the infants going all the way up to end of life. And there's an effort currently underway where we're partnering and there's a steering committee in various um, local communities of practice where we have representatives from um, Department of Aging, Department of Education and various different programs and um, departments and agencies so that we can look at that coordination because we really need to think about the trajectory and people's um, own uh, vision of their life, their life for a good life um, and starting very young and, and reaching high so that we're not, um, not aiming low. We, there's a lot we can do together partnering and if we start that early with intervention services and education by the time they get to the adult service delivery system they've been exposed um, similar to some of the different conversations we've had I think that's great it's um, a, a very strong theme of many of the departments within the School of Public Health is this idea of life course that there's good evidence mm. for what you can do in just universal prevention um, for all children and then targeted to specific children in the kindergarten to, age, to grade one ages, but then how one has to pay attention to the different types of intervention and um, maximization of potential kind of strategies that change at different stages of life. And so it's a great example of we may have students or others who, who already are believers in these things who could help you guys or work with you guys in some way. Great. Um, so it's, it's music to my ears to hear those things. Um, so another uh, question from the audience that's a little bit of a pivot. So as the number of individuals with ASD increases and the population ages, there will be greater challenges in treating medical comorbidities. We see a lot more about the reports of medical comorbidities in both children and adults with autism. So in your experience, um, are there any promising care models for this particular population that could be scaled up to meet these increasing needs in terms of handling those medical comorbidities? We were talking at lunch. Yeah. Medically, most of the individuals in the program are fairly well covered. What they don't get is any dental coverage. And I was sharing that uh, it's put us $200,000 in the hole uh, in the last year and a half paying for dental uh, for a population that isn't easy to take to the dentist. Uh, you can't just walk into any dentist's office and here they are. Um, it's a problem and a lot of uh, people need sedation dentistry with autism uh, and there's a higher cost associated. So that, that's an obstacle and that's a, a problem we've been working on. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sergeant. Uh, I, I see a real gap in mental health services, um, and that, that's huge because um, it impacts everything. You know, your ability to go to work, your ability to take care of yourself, and um, there's, there's a tremendous gap in, in finding resources in capacity um, in the number of providers and also in terms of access. And I think in, in 
terms of the school system, we see a lot of kids who may have a primary disability of autism spectrum disorder, but then also have other social emotional behavioral needs that may be the result of a comorbid mental health condition. And what we're seeing more and more and disproportionately in students who are identified as having a disability is them being um, excluded from public education um, through suspension or expulsion and other types of removals or removals to more restrictive placements. And so I think it's often difficult for IEP teams to be able to sort out what is um, a behavior that's associated with the autism spectrum disorder or what is a behavior associated with some other underlying mental health condition. And so it really creates a difficult um, situation for IEP teams and parents and students alike. Um, and you know, at the national level right now, the conversation is turning on students with disabilities being disproportionately excluded from school. I guess the thing that I would add to that is um, definitely as we um, advance and come up with um, new service models, uh, more behavioral supports, ABA that's being covered under Medicaid services and such, the provider capacity is definitely something that we're currently challenged with. Um, and what we try to do is we're supporting um, individuals that may have some co um, um, complex medical needs or a mental health type of behavioral health challenges is really we have to look at the person and where they are at right at that point. Um, because people with intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities, if, if there's primary been a, a behavioral health um, challenge that is the primary um, um, need, then that's where we need to focus on um, versus really looking at some of the other things. So it's really kind of coming to where the person is at that time and making sure that through wraparound services and supports we're addressing that need first so that then we can move forward with more education um, and other supports to help them reach their goals. Great. So another question that I think is relevant to, to being in this particular room um, is, as you know, many of us come from a very research perspective rather than a delivery of services in the community perspective. Um, and they, they certainly overlap in that, that evidence, you know, garnered hopefully translates into ways in which services are provided and which, what the content of services provided are. But we also do a lot of policy work and um, sort of economic evaluations and other public health kinds of um, things. In thinking about the, you know, what your thoughts around public health are, and you can define public health however you want for, in your own personal um, perspective, but thinking through that lens, you know, what, what do you see as a critical thing that public health folks are not doing that they should be doing? Yeah, please, go ahead. Well, number one is uh, identification uh, early of somebody with autism. Early diagnosis is critical. We sponsored a bill uh, in the Maryland House last year, and it failed. I guess it was opposed primarily uh, people who represent pediatricians just didn't want another thing layered on. Maybe there's legal liability. You didn't diagnose my son or daughter early enough, but we're going to take a run at it again and again and again until we get uh, state-mandated uh, diagnostic tools that physicians and pediatricians are using at a fairly young age to be able to identify these kids early. Then the other part is early intervention. And uh, there's a study by a big university done that shows that early intervention can save in excess of a million dollars in the lifespan of a person disabled with autism because that early intervention makes their trajectory higher. It gives them a higher functioning ability in the long run. So it's the biggest bang for the buck. So you spend you know, $25,000 when they're uh, two, three and years old, but it's a long-term savings. And particularly with numbers rising, it's going to be uh, critical to the future. I think on the flip, another sort of concern that I have is um, the data are pretty bleak in terms of adults with autism spectrum disorder and gainful employment and meaningful work opportunities. And so while we may be able to do a really good job in some jurisdictions for transition services from 14 to 21 or whenever the student exits the local school system, um, the data that exists in terms of obtaining um, meaningful employment and um, sustaining that over time are pretty grim. Um, and locally, we do have a number of employers um, in our state who are doing a really good job of employing individuals with disabilities um, and doing a great job of incorporating them into their work environments. But they don't do a great job of sort of sharing the message and sharing the outcomes and 
um, helping other employers um, who may want to replicate the model that they've existed. So I think we do need um, to figure out a way to recognize those employers at the local and state level that are doing a great job and help spread that message so that other employees will be willing to take risks and hire people with disabilities. Thank you. Others? Um, yeah, um, I think um, I, I want to stress I really value, you know, genetics research and some of the more medical side of the research that we're doing. But I just think that maybe, the, like as you were just talking about with employment, there's a little bit of an imbalance. If we're spending two or three billion dollars, you know, <laughs> on the genetic side and then we have an 80, 90 percent unemployment rate, like that's a little lopsided. Um, and then the other thing, too, is when we were looking at the numbers earlier and talking about things like early intervention, um, there's an access question, and I'm, I'm just going to put this out there um, delicately, which is that I think um, you know we have to look at factors like racism, sexism, poverty, all those cultural factors that are causing certain groups of people to maybe get diagnosed very late and then they miss out on that early intervention window or who are not sh showing up you know on paper but but they do exist and and how do we fix that problem and I guess I would just add that um, from my perspective it's it's policies and challenges related to federal policies or regulations that then kind of impact the states, which then are also impacting service delivery in terms of providers. And so as we look at innovative ways to provide new services, and I think that's going to be something we're going to have to continue to challenge ourselves with. You know, how do we support the, um, you know, different ages and the teenagers um, and the young adults and then older adults and then up to the 70s? There's, you know, it's all going to continue to change and evolve. So the new service delivery models and the new strategies are still yet to be determined, right? Because we're continually evolving compared to when you look at the history where we were told, just put people in institutions, look how far we've come, and yet there's so much more we need to do in terms of impacting not only employment, but true community membership. So it's really kind of looking at that. And as we move forward, there's always something that kind of pulls you back because you've got the old policies and regulations. We've got to keep that all moving at the same time um, so that we can continue to advance and really truly support people. I wanted to add the um, innovation from the perspective of, again, of the local school system. I, and I think um, the challenge uh, sometimes for us when we get the policies that then translate into the state, down to the local, and we are in this uh, space of we must do it all ourselves. Mm -hmm. So my challenge for all the locals watching <laughs> uh, is to come cross the county line with that. Let's figure out how to braid our resources, braid the funding. Think about the various partnerships that you have. Um, we have established a few partnerships because institutions are right in our backyards. But we don't have to feel like we need to do it in our jurisdiction. You know, the next county over has to do the same thing. How can we all work together to do that? Um, along the lines of innovation and figuring out how to uh, use what we have to make more. Uh, a couple of ideas. We have uh, recently engaged in a partnership uh, with um, an institution I, I won't name, but that's looking at uh, some research around mixing a set of instructional practices that will work well for improving out outcomes for students in the areas of social and language development. That's something that we can, in our district, lead the way, but then share those innovative practices with others that will impact, help impact other uh, children. Another example is uh, this idea of, uh, you know, behavior is communication. And so focusing on how we can use board certified behavior analysts to help us with our work. That's another thing that we in our district were going to uh, have a laser-like focus on, and we hope to share how well that works with neighboring jurisdictions. Um, one other idea that we were doing uh, most recently in an elementary classroom was anchored in, in the idea of um, augmentative and alternative communication. And we can't uh, hire a lot of different uh, roles, speech language pathologists and teachers, but we could think outside of the box and figure out how, for example, in this model, we use a particular role and did some job embedded coaching uh, around the usage of device. And it, it has good results. And so we'll be able to share those practices across county lines, thus impacting more students within our state. 
Thank you. Um, kind of related to some of the things that you have each mentioned, and and I guess springboarded off of, of a comment about you know the biggest bang for the buck it might be early detection and early intervention, but generally this idea of bang for the buck, that there are economic savings, which is one argument to be made. There are many other arguments as well, but in the economic argument, one of the challenges that prevention scientists have generally, not just in autism, is that the folks who spend the money for some kind of preventive effort are not the ones who, who benefit from that saving. So you spend the money in a kindergartner, but the saving is really happening at high school or transition or in adulthood, right? And, or the saving is happening in one kind of social, social services budget rather than an education budget or something like that. H how do you grapple with that? And how do you think through those and what could be done to help you know, de-silo that problem? Or is that an intractable problem? Well, the early intervention, uh, it, it's a financial aspect, but there's also the human aspect of, of giving a better quality life to a person who has a disability. And I would rank that, obviously, ahead of the money part. I think the money part is just a, a dividend and a benefit from that. Um, I, you, know, you know, it's one of those things, the early intervention is very hard because it, it's not a it's not a measurable scale that you can say, well, the person was here and we did this and now they're here. You can only uh, just kind of, there's no formula. So it's very, very difficult. Even in even examining people with autism, there's no, I know the state has like a matrix score and things like that, but it's it's so individualized and it's so hard to, to quantify sometimes. So it's not like you can say, well, if we spend this, we're going to have a 25% improvement. Uh, it's just been scientifically proved that, that that does help the individuals with autism. What percentage or measurable, it's hard to tell. Yeah, it kind of gets into like a philosophical um, side of things. Uh, you know, so you could say, well, maybe we're investing early on and I'm not the person who's necessarily gonna see that later. But in fact, you are, because if you have a more constructive person, then your community as a whole is gonna be functioning better. So there is a, a, a direct impact. Could you measure it? Maybe not, but I mean, I think it's clear to everybody. It just makes common sense. And I guess I, I'll go back to the life course framework um, because things are going to change along the whole course of the life, right? So even with a lot of early intervention and great wraparound um, services and supports, life happens, right? There's the death of a caregiver. There's something that happens. And so we've got to be able to, through that course, continue to make adjustments and provide those supports where people are at that time. Um, we look at kind of one person at a time and what those needs are because they're very diverse, right? Similar to people with autism or people with developmental disabilities or any disability, you really have to look at the whole person in the life course. I thought I saw someone else nodding. Oh, you're good. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me then ask back a little bit. So I asked you about the what you've seen as the challenges in the past several years and the challenges going forward, let's, let's couch it a little bit different way. If you could change a single thing right now that you thought would make a big difference for your particular sphere, you know, what would that be? What's the sort of talking point you're leading with right now? I, I'm not necessarily asking you to come up with something new, but just what have you been going and sort of advocating as the thing right now? Um, first, um, we've been in the midst of transformation and some of our priorities and activities include supporting families um, because we know the majority of the people um, in Maryland and, and nationally um, are really not known to service delivery systems that really the family and those and um, informal caregivers are really supporting um, people with disabilities so they're not even known to us um, and that's just going to continue um, to grow as times go forward. Um, another area that we're focusing on is employment. Um, we refer to ourselves as an employment first state in partnership with other state agencies and entities. And what that means is, is that employment should be the first discussion that we have with um, people with um, working age. And so looking and exploring through um, new communities of practice, such as employment discovery, where you're really customizing a job, um, which we kind of heard a little bit about today, is really going to be critical because we've, for us to really impact and get integrated in the workforce, we really have to look at the skills and, and um, um, abilities of people versus looking at jobs and trying to fit people within it. 
So looking at um, employment and um, supporting families in addition to housing opportunities. Um, and the other area would be self-direction and self-determination. Working with self-advocates to really um, help the advocacy skills of people to make their own decisions and to really direct their life course is really critical through um, you know, very focused, what we refer to as person-centered planning and opportunities so that people um, make their own decisions with supports that they need. And I would second that in terms of um, helping to educate uh, children and young adults with disabilities about their disabilities so that they are prepared when they are exiting the local school system to be able to articulate their strengths and their weaknesses and their areas of need and help them understand their disability and how it might impact them on a college campus or in the workplace. Um, I represented hundreds and hundreds of kids across the state of Maryland over the last 13 years and one of the things that I've seen is that parents are really very protective and sheltering um, their child. And the parent knows all about their disability and their child's strengths and weaknesses and cl clearly articulate that. But then when their child exits the local school system and they are going to their disability support services office at their local university, the student is expected to articulate what their needs are and how their disability should be accommodated at the university level. And they really can't, and that's really a barrier for them. Them, or they do not understand how to complete a DDA application or to understand um, how to explain exactly what services and supports they need to be successful as adult, an adult in our community. And so I think starting early um, in helping the child or young adult to understand their disability and the impact it has across all domains um, is critically important as we move forward. Exactly what she said. <laughs> <laughs> that is super important for the education of the families and people and uh, just understanding problems that occur. I mean, I had a parent call me uh, a couple weeks ago and said, my son wants a girlfriend. You know, I mean, how, how do you deal with a problem like that? Um, but, yeah, education for the families is, is really important. Um, I think a continued focus on uh, presuming confidence uh, not just for students, but also for staff and families. And um, when we focus on presuming competence, it's that idea that probably many of you have heard about, and that's making the least dangerous assumption about our students, about our teachers, about our families. And so I think that's a, a, a takeaway, is that if we work together and maximize our resources to help everyone focus again on how we presume that people uh, want to, that they can, that they will, that they are, uh, that that is going to be a good place for us to be. And um, I just want to iterate the points about families and family partnership and making sure that we're educating, not leave, I've done a lot of talking about teachers and related service providers, but a really strong component of our teaming is that parent and is that student. And so I think that's another major takeaway is in all that we do around professional learning and building capacity, where is the parent, where is the child in helping them uh, gain a better understanding about how to improve the lives of, of their uh, family member with disabilities. I would like to second everything that people said. I think this was great. Um, I just throw in there the peers too. Um, and so that, that kind of ties into the, the, the quick point that I wanted to make is that oftentimes what we see is that barriers in society are more of a problem than being disabled. So looking at those, the, like the attitudes of other people, the, the um, you know, barriers in employment to, or health care and, and, you know, having more conversations in society about that. You know, that's what my students essentially, they have to look at ableism in society and, and start figuring this out and talking about it more and talking about it very directly. Yeah, that speaks to the question that came from the audience earlier too about how we, how we promote a society of acceptance. And um, I guess my, my thought when hearing about the, the person, the staff, and the family, and now peers is it's often when it, because I often think about what's different about thinking about autism as a childhood disorder versus thinking about autism as a life course disorder. <laughs> and one of the things that I think might be different is that we often talk about parents as the family, whereas when we think about adults, the family may be siblings, cousins, peers, other kinds of um, folks that are not the traditional what we think of when we're, when we're servicing children. Yeah. 
So we'll go slightly over, and so in this time, I'm gonna ask one more question, but I wanna remind all of you, if you have a burning last question, now's your chance to get one of those sheets of paper and write it down. Um, my question is, uh, Li Ching mentioned it in several different ways, um, and you as panelists have mentioned in several different ways, the role that disparities in access or disparities in stigma or other things might play um, in how we see the movement in the future for these service provisions and for integration into community. And so what are some of your organizations or you personally uh, doing or thinking about in trying to narrow the disparities gap, and I don't just mean disparities by skin color or ancestry, but also disparities by um, sexual preference or gender identity um, or socioeconomic status, those kinds of things. I mean, I think one issue that we are facing at the Maryland Center for Developmental Disabilities is um, outreach to more rural parts of our state. Mm -hmm. So talking about ABA services in the Baltimore metropolitan region is completely different than talking about ABA services in Somerset County or Worcester County where they're non-existent. Um, and so, you know, I think we have to think about our geographic reach and how we can take those best practices that may be implemented here in the Baltimore metropolitan area and extend the reach um, to the far corners of our state where there are um, thousands of children with disabilities and young adults who need services and supports and taking, you know, what we know about how to help um, individuals obtain meaningful gainful employment, what we're doing here and try to replicate it in those parts of the states. That's definitely been a big challenge for us, but a focal point um, and I am hopeful that you know other organizations and agencies will try to focus um, on those rural parts of our states as well okay. anybody else I know that's a tough one <laughs> um, I'll jump in I think uh, doing a lot of um, personal advocacy and systems advocacy where you can so if you see um, an approach to one child and then the approach to another child is different because of gender or race and and just having some questions about that and looking at that and and you know um, just doing trainings um, where you work or, or in the different systems that you intersect with and and asking these questions we don't always have the perfect answer but the first step is to question and I would just add keeping that focus on equity and diversity and inclusion I mean you know fo ha having that focus in a local school system on those three components and matters of cultural profici proficiency excuse me and recognizing and acknowledging that it is an inside out process that's going to translate into your students it that's going to be key right and I guess I would just add that you know education is is very very critical particularly when we talk about um, the society and providers but also family members um, the, the question from the, the parent that he got related to having a girlfriend that could be very challenging for um, family members when you talk about adults in service delivery system um, related to wanting to be married and have children and, and have you know a variety of different um, activities a grown-up type of activities and that's very hard um, for sometimes for family members so we really need to provide education and be focusing on the choice of the person um, with supports that, that are there and providing opportunities for people to um, be supported in a variety of areas regardless of um, um, their preferences their their sexual orientation those type of things Yeah, so this is in some sense related to that, and this is a comment from a member of our audience um, as an autistic person in the audience to not forget or erase that families of autistic adults um, also include our own partners and our own children, and that um, their society may not see autistic individuals as capable partners or parents, but indeed that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, thank you for that. And then, um, one last opportunity for the panelists to say, do you see any program or um, intervention or however you want to couch it that is the gold standard right now that you wish more people were emulating? Uh, wish they were more, we're emulating ours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. fair. That's, a, that's a fair answer. <laughs> For me, it's um, tapping into the board certified behavior analyst. I mentioned that earlier, but just from the perspective of focusing on skill acquisition and or behavior reduction and utilizing that body of research 
and the expertise that uh, those individuals bring uh, for enhancing current and existing behavior teams and support staff in our locals, that's something I wish every district would uh, begin to tackle. And I think that we are in many districts. I guess I will continue to advocate for supporting families, um, looking at the life course, um, employment, particularly the discovery process. There's new um, national competency-based training for um, service providers related to discovery um, as we kind of move forward related to that. I definitely want to echo the behavioral support type services through ABA and other professionals um, because we can provide a variety of support that doesn't necessarily have to be a formalized behavior plan. Um, sometimes I think we lose the basic things just as compliments and, and positive reinforcement that we all need on a daily basis, let alone a formalized behavior plan. Um, and behavior is, is communication and oftentimes um, it gets mis, um, overlooked. It gets overlooked and we really don't look at it to really see the communication there. Um, I would just like to second what you've been saying about um, discovery process. The other term is customized employment, and um, it really works. And um, we just have to decide that, that we want to make that investment in people. And I don't know that I have the gold standard, but I would say that, you know, we do have a lot of really good services and supports and programs um, in our area that um, could be really great models to be replicated. And I don't see a lot of local school systems admitting, you know, oh, we're right around the corner from Kennedy Krieger and there's a great school program and maybe we could just go do a tour and replicate this model. Um, I don't see a lot of outreach, you know, to, to what Dr. Savage was saying, where we could just say, we don't need to re invent the wheel. We don't need to create a whole other autism program in Baltimore City. We can just go out and see what our neighbors are doing and try to replicate some of those things that are working. I wish there was more of that occurring. So convening or mixing of individuals for lessons learned yep. might be a low-hanging fruit option for yeah. a lot of these. Great. Well, I want to thank all five of you for taking the time out of your schedules to come here this afternoon and to share with us. I hope this is the beginning of continued conversations between public health and community partners and not a one-time event. So thank you very much. Sure. Thanks.